Hello, good evening. I would like to welcome you to our Shakespeare event organized by Euromedia Forum. We are an NGO which basically enjoys to discuss media, all types of media, what is the message behind them, what inspires this art, and what um, are the issues which you can discuss which arises from, from this media. Today we're going to discuss Shakespeare, as we said, in the occasion of the 450th anniversary. We have with us an excellent speaker. It's uh, Martin Bugelli. <laughs> he's telling me that you have to judge if he's an excellent speaker or not. <laughs> so I'll leave it up to you. A round of applause, please. I always love it when I get the applause before I start speaking because that means that I'm happy. I've got my applause already. However hopeless I am, I'm home and dry. So, good evening and welcome. As Flair said, my name is Martin Bugelli and I'm an amateur follower of uh, Shakespeare. I don't claim to be an expert. I don't claim to be a professor of literature or anything like that. I just love the man and his works and the passion that he instilled in his works, I think some of it rubbed off on me because I just love doing anything to do with watching plays, talking about them, reading them, quoting them, finding some expression that we managed to get from his works. And for today I prepared a very short, a short talk about my perceptions of what we called Shakespeare's Europe. So good evening and welcome. And the prologue to one of his great history plays, Henry V, Shakespeare has a minor actor showing up on stage as the chorus, appear on stage, and introduce the play. Shakespeare uses this introduction to apologize in advance for the lack of scenery which he has on stage, because he knows that no amount of scenery can really ever be enough to satisfy the requirements of the great story that he is about to say, to, to give to people that it's about to be enacted. He says, but pardon and gentles all, the flat unraised spirits that have dared on this unworthy scaffold to bring forth so great an object. He refers to the shortcomings of the stage because can this cockpit hold the vast fields of France or may we cram within this wooden O, the wooden O being the globe, theatre it was in an O shape, it was a circle, the very casks that did affright the air at Agincourt. He appeals to the imagination of the audience, asking for the help of their imaginary forces work and to suppose within the girdle of these walls are now confined two mighty monarchies. Let your imagination run rife, he says. Think when we talk of horses that you see them, printing their proud hoofs in the receiving earth, for it is your thoughts that now must deck our kings. Carry them here and there, jumping over times, turning the accomplishment of many years into an hourglass. Because the play was relatively short. It was just an hour, one hour and a half. And, at one an and in that one hour and a half, he had to tell the story of a king whose reign lasted four years. This introduction, however, tells us very clearly about just how much Shakespeare believed in the power of the spoken and even more the acted word to draw pictures and to lay out actions in the human mind. His efforts were successful. And in this short time that I have here with you, I hope to emulate, in part, and in a very small percentage, for I am no bard myself, what he managed to achieve. I shall be using just words, some of his, some of my own, to try and pass on to you my impressions of this great man through the legacy of wisdom, wealth, and wit that he left behind. It's 1564, we're in Valletta. 1564, Valletta did not exist. It was one year before the Great Siege, which was enacted over on the other side of the Grand Harbor. Valletta had not even been thought of, let alone built. The southern parts of Europe knew very well who the enemy was, the Ottoman Empire, with its expansion eastward and northward, threatening the whole of Christendom. The Americas had been discovered just over 70 years before, and were providing Spain with riches beyond all expectations. Walter Raleigh had not yet been knighted Sir Walter Raleigh, as he was still only 10 years old. He had not yet done anything remarkable to earn that title. And Queen Elizabeth I 
had been queen for less than six years. It's the 23rd of April, 1564. I said the year already, it's 1564. And we're in a small market town called Stratford on the River Avon. The name Stratford itself is a combination of the old English strat, meaning street, and ford, indicating a site at which a road forded the river. It's a very small town. John Shakespeare had been living there for a number of years. He was quite well off, running his business as a glove maker and a leather merchant. His wife, Mary, from the Arden family, a landed family, and the gentry, he married rich, he married above his standards. She was in the process of giving birth for the third time. Unfortunately, her two previous pregnancies had not been very lucky, as her first two daughters, Joan and Margaret, had both died in infancy. Today, however, will prove to be a turning point for her childbearing fortunes, as a boy, William, was born. William would be followed by another five babies, four of whom would survive to adulthood, and one, Anne, dying before she was eight years old. William would prove to be a blessing not only for his family, he would grow to become, if I attribute some modesty to his description, one of the greatest writers ever to walk this world. If I show less modesty in his regard and more honesty, I would be very safe in calling him the greatest writer, not just one of them. What England, what Europe was William born into? In order to understand his works better and try to measure the impact he had on the collective English psyche, we need to have a rough idea of the internal developments in England in those times and before. The Queen, Elizabeth I, was the daughter of Henry VIII from his second marriage. He had six marriages. Her mother was Anne Boleyn. Henry had first struck up a relationship with her sister Mary, also a lady in waiting to the Queen, as was Anne. It seems that the King liked to test the level of service of the hired help for himself, as two of his subsequent wives were also ladies in waiting to his Queen. She used to do the personal interview type and take it a bit too far, I think. Anne, however, unlike her sister, refused to be just a mistress and wanted marriage. If he wants the bling, he has to get the ring. <laughs> no test drives were on the table. Henry, disappointed at Catherine of Aragon, his first wife's failure to give him the son he wanted so much, he decided to go for it. And in the process, he initiated the English Reformation, the process of transforming England from a Catholic country to a Protestant one. A, quite a high price to pay for, for a few hours, not very long, of pleasure with one of the help. But anyhow, he went for it. In fact, following this incident, between 1532 and 1537, Henry instituted a number of statutes that dealt with the relationship between king and pope, and hence laid the foundations of the Church of England. This was a far cry from his defense of the seven sacraments, which had earned him the title of Fidei Defensor, Defender of the Faith, from the Catholic Pope Leo X. Anne Boleyn would be executed, her head chopped off to make way for the next queen, but not before having given Henry a daughter, Elizabeth, in September 1533. Henry died after a full, in all possible interpretations of the term, life in 1547. He lived life to the hilt. He had too much, he loved too much, he did everything a little bit too much, he was overweight, he was obese, and he died. He lived his life. And after two or three other monarchs, including Edward VI, and Mary I, Bloody Mary, the Catholic Mary, the daughter of Catherine, and for a time even Philip of Spain himself, Elizabeth came to the throne on the 17th November, 1558. And slightly less than six years later, we arrive at the point where we started. William Shakespeare was born. He went to school, learned Latin, and also some Greek. It wasn't all Greek to him. And 18 years old, he got married to a woman seven or eight years his senior, Anne Hathaway. Not, not the one you've seen in The Devil Wears Prada. She was, that, that's, that's now, this is then. But it, it, uh, you know, history keeps repeating itself. We keep coming across the same milestones. They had two daughters, 
Susanna in 1583 and Judith in 1585. But shortly after this, he moved to London. But we do know that he worked as an actor and took part as an actor in the production of plays written by both his contemporary and friend, Christopher Marlowe, well known for his Dr. Faustus, Dido, and Jew of Malta, as well as in plays by his contemporary, albeit not so much his friend, Ben Jonson, of Volpone, the alchemist, and every man in his humor fame. In fact, he's first registered as having acted in Every Man in His Humor, in, in, a, part, in a play written by Ben Jonson. It was followed by Every Man Out of His Humor. He, he acted in his humor first. The first play that Shakespeare wrote was probably The Two Gentlemen of Verona. It's first recorded as having been produced in 1592 as a comedy, and he is believed to have started work on it about three years before it was produced, in 1589. It shows his first tentative steps in laying out some of the themes and motifs with which he would later deal and also make use of heavily in his productions. He would take the themes that he explored with in The Two Gentlemen of Verona, delve into more detail and build upon them to create greater works. Because The Two Gentlemen of Verona is not only his first play, it's also considered to be one of his lesser plays. But when you see it in the whole picture, it's like the taster which set us on the track to see what he could actually produce. In it, we see the complication of a heroine dressing as a boy. This complication of having a young man acting a female part, because women were not allowed on stage then, then having the female character he's pretending to be dressing up as a man, so to be a boy dressing up as a man to act as a woman, is quite complicated to say the least. Just imagine how even more complicated it could get when you consider the use of this theme in Shakespeare in Love. I'm sure you all remember Shakespeare in Love, the 1998 British-American romantic comedy starring Gwyneth Paltrow and Joseph Fiennes, where there we have a girl who wants to act. And in order to be able to act, she dresses up as a man. So once she's a man, she goes on stage. And then she gets a part as a woman. And then as a woman, the character has to change and disguise herself as a man. The mind boggles. In Shakespeare's plays, we shall see this transgender disguising very often, with the merchant of Venice's Portia perhaps being the most notable. The Two Gentlemen of Verona also deals with many other themes, friendship and infidelity, the conflict between friendship and love, and the foolish behavior of people in love. We are also introduced to the first use by Shakespeare of a comic character. In this play, it's Lawns. Two Gentlemen has the smallest cast of any play by Shakespeare, and as I already said, is commonly regarded as one of his weakest plays. And yet, it has the ingredients that he would later transform into so much more. It also begs the question, when did Shakespeare go to Verona? Ryanair were not yet in operation then, so <laughs> did he go to Verona? After all, one of his most well-known plays is set there, Romeo and Juliet. And once we come to it, where did Shakespeare travel, if at all? From the little that we know of William Shakespeare's exact 52 years on this world, between the 30th 23rd of April 1564 and the 23rd of April 1616, he died on his birthday. I think, I think he blew too much when he was blowing out his candles and it gave him something in his lungs. He went bad. It seems that his idea of travel was very much in line with that expressed by his creation, Rosalind, in As You Like It. Jacques, the melancholy Jacques, talking with Rosalind, describes himself as a traveler and says... I'm serious because I have traveled so much. In reply, Rosalind says that she'd rather have a fool to make her marry than experience, which Jack has claimed to have acquired from his travels, than experience to make her sad and to travel for it too. She also describes Jacques as a traveler with great reason to be sad, as she fears that he has sold his own land to see other men's, than to have seen much. And to have nothing is to have rich eyes and poor hands. 
Shakespeare lived in Stratford first, then in London, and he traveled to and fro frequently. He was a commuter. And unlike what Pistol tells the great Falstaff in The Merry Wives of Windsor, the world was not his oyster. England, or rather a small part of it was. He never traveled beyond the shores of what John of Gaunt in Richard II describes as the sceptered isle. No wonder that John, later on in the same monologue, also refers to England as this little world. Shakespeare's world was England. And it was a very young England that he was living in. In my brief introduction of the historical background, we looked at how just a few decades before he started writing, Henry V, the Eighth, sorry, had initiated the break with the Catholic Church and the power of Rome over all of Europe. With the laying of the foundation stones of the Church of England, Henry VIII had also initiated the formation and establishment of the England we know today. The fiercely proud England, resistant to outside influence, with her own high standards of morality, always ready to face impossible odds and even to stand alone if necessary, always as long as it's on the side of the perceived right side of history. But then it was still a far cry from that. It was still a very young England. It was still being formed. It was, it was a time when Shakespeare started writing, when England was still recovering from its relatively recent wars of succession, known as the, known as the Wars of the Roses, which had lasted over 32 years and supposedly ended just 100 years before. I say supposedly ended because they never quite ended for, for a number of years after that. But they were supposed to have ended when Henry Tudor was put on the throne. Elizabeth's grandfather, Henry VII. These wars had pitted Englishmen against Englishmen, brother against brother, father against son and son against father. Shakespeare best brings out these decades of bitter strife in a very simple yet powerful scene in Henry VI, part three, when the king Henry VI, that is, in two successive moments, first meets a father who has just killed his son in battle. Then, just a few moments later, he meets a young man who has just killed his own father, who was on the other side of the line. Two different instances where a father kills his son in battle, who was on the other side, and then just after, he meets a young man who's just killed his father. It's two generations. It's, it's, it's bizarre. The English identity that we know today was nowhere near being formed yet. It was still in tatters. We must also remember now that when Shakespeare was writing and producing his plays, at the time, there was no television, there was no cinema, no internet. Printing was as yet an almost futuristic technology, and most of the population was illiterate anyhow. Newspapers did not exist. The theater was the only means of mass communication of education and of passing on messages, of propaganda for the regime, for knowledge. But Shakespeare sensed that he was at a turning point in history. He was born at the right place, in the right time, and having the right abilities. His works indicate that he felt that he wanted to do something about it. So he used the theater, in which he also had a commercial interest, to achieve all the aims of his life. He wanted to support his family, he wanted to write, he wanted to express his feelings, and at the same time he wanted to influence the turn of history. His series of history plays were the result. Starting with King John, then skipping a century, he went on to write a succession of plays about Henry VIII, the father of his days England, came to the throne. Treating historical detail liberally, always for dramatic purposes, suffice it to say that in the beginning of Henry VI, part one, he refers to the king as still being too young. Uh, there's some nobles discussing this new king. He's just, Henry V, this glorious, brave king, had just died. And his son, Henry VI, is described as that he's still a bit too young to govern, to take over the reign. He was nine months old. I think that's the, that's the understatement of the millennium. 
So he did treat historical detail liberally, and in the development of the play, what he said before about cramming all that time into an hourglass, literally an hour, because just after the, success, the funeral takes place, the, the baby is nine months old, he, he's getting engaged. And so this happens in two minutes, and there's no indication. Shakespeare was very clever, because he never indicated that he was nine months old at the time. He just described him as too young, thus giving credibility to the sequence of events as he lays them out on the play, because otherwise it would be impossible to lay out the time frame of historical events in a play. That's what we call dramatic license. And that's why he also apologized for the time element and he apologized for the stage element. How can you have the vast fields of France on this little theater? So use your imagination. I shall transport you to all of Europe. I shall transport you to all these actions and happenings. Just help me out here. Think a little bit. He, however, penned some of the greatest words ever written about England. Let us, for example, take Henry IV, written in two parts. At the siege of Harfleur, in a battle against the French, he gives us the lines, Once more unto the breach, dear friends, once more, or close the wall up with our English dead. After some more eloquent lines and comparisons with great men of history, he has the king shouting, The game's afoot. Follow your spirit and upon this charge cry, God for Harry, England and St. George. We still have a Harry today, so it still applies. <laughs> I think it was here a couple of weeks ago. Not the same Harry, though, was it? <laughs> Later on in that same play, on the eve of St. Crispin's Day and the Battle of Agincourt, the king utters the famous lines, We few, we happy few, we band of brothers, for he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. The English, outnumbered five to one, won that decisive battle. And here Shakespeare showed the power of words in hardening men for battle. These two lines I have just quoted would find themselves echoed in the 20th century. The first well-known instance, is the phrase coined here, Band of Brothers. It was a 10-part television series, best-selling, award-winning series. Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks were the brains behind it, but there were a lot of famous actors. It's based on the best-selling book of the same name by Stephen Ambrose. It tells the story of a young group of American paratroopers from the first day of the training through D-Day and on to the final victory and the immediate aftermath of the Second World War. Another echo, maybe not so famous and maybe not so easy to trace, is to be found in a speech by that other great English wordsmith, Winston Churchill. If we take his middle name, Winston Spencer Churchill, I think W.S. has the same two initials as William Shakespeare, so it's only natural that he does the same thing. And when referring to the vastly outnumbered pilots of the RAF during the Battle of Britain, he borrowed the use of the word few. Maybe I'm reading too much into it, but everything else fits, so maybe I'm not. He borrows the use of the word few from Shakespeare and said, never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. The element of outnumbering, the element of fighting on your own, the element of going for it and really standing up for England and St. George was all there. When we consider the hundreds who would flock to this theater to watch these plays, when we consider these powerful and moving words working on their emotions and their imaginations, convincing them of the greatness of a Britain that was not yet called Great Britain, in a time when the English desperately wanted to become one nation, when they had a queen who was learned and ambitious for her country, these words worked on them, worked on these hundreds, and in their totality, the hundreds were thousands, because 100 a day, 100, 200 a day, it would be thousands. And the population was still very small then. And they had nowhere else to go. They had nothing else to listen to. They would regularly be imbued with Shakespeare's vision and vaccinated against any negative perceptions coming from beyond their shores. The English character of today was born under the open skies of the central part of the Globe Theater. Because the Globe was, in part, a roofless theater, so... It's, again, we can also draw another analogy with Valletta. Part of it was ruthless because the, the central part was where the penny groundlings would stand. 
those who couldn't afford to pay the large sums of money, they would stand for the hours, and if it's raining, they would get wet. I got wet once at the Globe, watching the Tempest. And Prosper was Vanessa Redgrave. And it was very appropriate, because throughout the play, it rained. It never stopped raining, so I got very, very wet. I paid five pounds sterling now. It's not a penny anymore. This was 10 years ago. It's still five pounds, by the way. But you can pay a bit more, about 40 pounds sterling today, and sit in on the benches in the thatch covered outer perimeter, where in his day, in Shakespeare's day, the nobles and the gentry would sit, who could afford to pay the higher seats. They might even have had their own stall. There's a scene in Shakespeare in Love when the queen, Elizabeth I, walks into the globe. There is no historical confirmation that the queen ever went beyond the Thames, because the, the theaters were on the other side of the Thames. It's near Blackfriars Bridge on the other side, on the Waterloo side. And uh, this was because of plague and prevention of disease. Theatres were not allowed on the government side because they might lead to rebellion, they might lead to a lot of things. So they were kept there. But the, the, in, in that scene, in Shakespeare in Love, we see the modern globe which was reconstructed in the 90s. And uh, it's, it's worth a visit because immediately upon walking into this empty, even if it's empty, even if there are no plays, walking in there, you will see immediately the appeal of the stage for the, the people standing in front and the classy, posh people at the back. It's a, if I were to give an example to the type of theater that we have today, it is the Institut Katolku together with Manuel Theater all in one. The people who go for a good laugh and for some entertainment, the people who consider themselves to be more classy and who go for the higher type of culture, merge them into one and Shakespeare managed to address them both. He also managed to bring the whole world which at the time was Europe, to his London stage. It wasn't just the fields of France. The Roman Empire provided the setting for Julius Caesar, Coriolanus, and Titus Andronicus, with the latter's ghastly end scene of a mother eating her own two sons unknowingly after Titus had cooked them into a pie. The scene of Titus wearing a chef's hat, serving this pie to the mother when she asks where her sons are. He tells her, you've just eaten them. I've just cooked them for you in that pie. So can you, I ask the question, how Roman is a pie? Did the Romans have pies? Or is pie so typically English? So by attributing the pie, but I will talk about attribution of English traditions to other countries a bit later. But just think about Julius Caesar actually eating pie. France over, also provided the setting for many plays, such as Love's Labour's Lost, and many of the history plays. Well, Italy, oh, Italy. Verona and its star-crossed lovers, Romeo and Juliet. Venice with its merchant, Antonio, and the Jew, Shylock. Even Sicily and its lovely noblewoman, Paulina. Denmark's Hamlet being or not being to his heart's content. Austria's Vienna in measure for measure and the treatment of the morality of leadership. And Cyprus where most of the action of Otello happens. However, as I referred to earlier, Shakespeare only imported the names of the locations, and he then managed to attribute Englishness to them. The best example of this is to be found in A Midsummer Night's Dream. The summer solstice midsummer tradition, spending the whole night out in revelry and celebration in the forests, was at the time an ordinary European one, an English one. It was associated with inherited pagan ideas. And the English version of this inherited tradition included the legends of spirits themselves coming out for a romp, having fun in the forest, and interacting with humans in all sorts of ways. It is definitely not Greek or Athenian in character. Yet Shakespeare has it happening in Athens, where I'm not sure there are any forests to speak of. And he also uses it very cleverly to have the play within a play concept. Also, at the same time, managing to honor Queen Elizabeth, who was a guest at the wedding for which this play had been commissioned. It is the only time registered when the Queen herself went to see one of Shakespeare's plays. Before I move on to my final point, there is one location which I would also like to highlight, the Bermudas. In May 1609, towards the end of Shakespeare's writing career, a fleet of nine vessels under the command of Sir George Somers sailed from England with provisions 
and 500 settlers for the newly founded colony of Virginia. Virginia was an English colony in the Americas. In fact, it was called Virginia in honor of England's queen, who was not called Virginia, but who was hailed as the Virgin Queen. She was a very popular queen. The, the English had managed to unite themselves under the screen. She had started expanding the reach of England. On July the 25th of that year, a storm separated one of the ships called the Sea Adventure from the other vessels of the fleet. And with summers, it was wrecked three days later on the coast of the Bermudas. The crew reached one of the islands in safety. And in May 1610, continued their voyage to Virginia on two boats which they had built on the island. Meanwhile, news of this disaster had reached England, and when, in 1610, some of those who had taken part in these thrilling experiences returned home, the excitement was intense. Their description of this island, of, what, of the tropics, was something so new to the English that they just could, for them it was heaven on earth in a way, it was magical. At least four narratives of this wreck and the adventures that followed appeared in that year, and Shakespeare probably had access to reading all of them. It is not unlikely that he would have learned some details also directly from the lips of the returned sailors and adventurers themselves. And it's probably from here that he found the inspiration to create an island somewhere in the sea, which was the setting for his last play, The Tempest. The Tempest is not set anywhere. It's not attributed to being in any place anywhere in the world. It's somewhere in the sea. And it's an island. And things happen. And among the things that happen, that Shakespeare deal, deals with, there's a character who's Caliban. And Caliban is a negative. And he gives... There's a confusion. It's not actually a confusion. It's a double idea when, when he presents Caliban. There was... Prior to Shakespeare's work, there was a treatise by Montaigne which led to the concept of the noble savage. And in fact, there's a, there's a whole small paragraph which is directly lifted from Montaigne's work. And this Caliban was... He, Pro, um, Prospero found Caliban living on the island. We're using his magical powers. He manages to dominate this native... And in the way that Shakespeare writes the play, he is introducing the idea of colonization and the idea of slavery. And the idea also the idea that Western influence on the simple noble savage is not always positive. And at some stage, Caliban says, I swear, I use dirty words because I learned them from you. I did not know them before. I learned them from you. But at the end, Shakespeare takes it a step further because Prospero eventually sets Caliban free. And this is quite a number of years, many years, before the English decided to say that slavery was no more. This was at least 200 years before Wilberforce. So the, uh, Shakespeare was not just writing for his audience then. He had his ideals. He was putting them on paper. And he put himself into Prospero. This was the last play he ever wrote. And in the last scene of The Tempest, Prospero, the magician who had these magic books, throws away his books, reneges on his magic. He doesn't want to do it anymore. This is over. This is all. Now I go back to living a normal life, Prospero says. And the magic that Prospero used on the island was the magic that Shakespeare used in writing his plays. Because Prospero controlled people with his magic. He could make them do things. He could change nature. He could change the weather. He could make things happen like storms and sea with huge waves. And that's what Shakespeare did on stage. He did it using imagination, and imagination can be magic. So he put himself into Prospero and signed off his career. It would, however, be an injustice, a major injustice, if today I were to speak only of Shakespeare's success in contributing to the English character of today and the English view of the outer world. Harold Bloom, the famous American critic and Sterling Professor of Humanities at Yale University, would, speaking of Shakespeare, refer to the invention of the human. In his works, 
Shakespeare managed to bring out so many of the human characteristics that make up man and woman. Envy, jealousy, ambition, pride, betrayal, lust, greed, anger, love and its fickle nature, and unreasoning hate, superstition, wisdom, kindness, and generosity. Just to mention a few. He managed to address all levels of society concurrently at the same time. Frequently interspersing minor comic characters and comic moments with serious and grave scenes. The scene just after the murder of the king and Macbeth comes to mind when just after this act, this unacceptable act, regicide, something which was not acceptable at the time. A king had just been murdered, an anointed king had just been murdered. Immediately after that, we have the scene of the porter and the banging at the door. And the audience gets to relax. The audience gets to release some of the tension which had been caused by the previous scene. He keeps everybody happy. Both the stall people, the snobs, and the yard penny groundlings, what we today would call the marmalia, the hamalli, who would stand on the front and wait for the funny moments, not understanding everything else, and just laughing when it was time to laugh, and enjoying the gore and the blood and the action. But the high moments would go be high above their heads, straight into the stalls. So that was his ability. One particular... Um, paragraph that I remember where Shakespeare was, was at his most didactic, when he was at his most historically correct was when in Henry VI I think it was in part 3 he has Richard who would eventually become Richard III the hunchback not, not, it was actually Richard it was the father of the hunchback it was Richard of York who fathered the hunchback. He's talking to two of his nobles, trying to convince them to come on his side into the War of the Roses. I'm sure you're familiar with the white roses and the red roses, white against red, colors and everything. It was a simple incident which led to these wars. Whoever was wearing a white rose was with these guys, whoever was wearing a rose was with these guys. And York had the white rose. But Shakespeare has Richard of York justifying his claim to the throne. And in the way that Richard justifies the claim, there's a very boring two or three minute um, intervention by Richard where he describes the genealogy, the step-by-step -step succession procedure. He was the father of this guy and this guy married this woman and they had this child, but this child died so the, the succession goes back here. And he lays out the total um, family tree of the family of York and how he had a claim. But while explaining the, the genealogy and the, the right of succession that the Yorks had, he also strengthened the idea and the education of how Henry VIII had come to the throne after his, fa after his father, Henry VII. So who was, in a way, supporting the throne also of that day. I referred to him being able to speak to two levels of audience at the same time. And I've already referred to Midsummer Night's Dream in the non-European English attribution of traditions. But the Midsummer Night's Dream also has another major importance because we have Bottom, the funny Bottom, and his men, providing the counterbalance to the noblemen and noblewomen, as well as the deities, putting all the three strata together in one popular and much appreciated work of entertainment. I, I think it's the play which has been acted most in summer over the whole wide world. Romeo and Juliet is associated with uh, love and tragedy. There's Macbeth, the Scottish play, but Midsummer Night's Dream is the play to have at the height of summer in San Anton Gardens when it's warm and everybody's sitting out. Most people are wearing short sleeves and you just have a pleasant and funny time. And in this play, we have a goddess 
falling in love with an idiot who has an ass's head. And we have a very modern thing, at least I see it as modern, because we have some noble couples changing their partners after being influenced by some white powder. I'm sure that still happens nowadays, but maybe not in the way that Shakespeare wrote it, but it's still there. It was a very far-reaching observation on Shakespeare's part. Shakespeare also gave us so many of today's expressions in the English language. What's in the name? And in Mark Antony's speech, in Julius Caesar, he has him starting, it's a lesson to many politicians, maybe. Because Mark Antony starts off his speech saying, friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. And the key word is lend. When we are speaking to people, when we have an audience, you only lend us speakers. I'm a speaker today, so I count with the speakers. You only lend us your ears. You only lend us your attention. It's yours. You didn't give it to us. So once you've lent us your attention, you can have it back any time you like. And it's up to us to make sure that you forget that it was just a loan and that we can keep it for as long as possible. Because otherwise, you take it back very quickly and then we we'll, we'll lose the audience. So even in, there's a lesson there, even for whoever wants to address an audience. Other words that he, in his time, were neologisms, they were new words. We have arch-villain, birthplace, blood-sucking, courtship, dewdrop, downstairs, fanged, heart sore, hunchbacked, leapfrog, misquote, pageantry, radiance, schoolboy, stillborn, watchdog, and zany, all owe their origin to one or other of his plays. Even the political phrase, used in the time of the Vietnam War and since Hearts and Minds was coined by him and attributed to Mark Anthony, the speech I already referred to starting with the lending of the ears, who when Julius Caesar says, O oh, sirs, if I stirred your hearts and minds to mutiny and rage, I would offend Brutus. He's saying, I don't want to do this, but I'm planting the idea anyhow. Because that's what we know. When you are talking about something and you mention an idea, even if you're saying that you don't agree with that idea, the fact that you've referred to it subconsciously, you have planted the idea. So if he stirs their hearts and minds, their hearts, their emotions, and their minds, their logic. Because when you address people in politics, in entertainment, we function at two levels. We have hearts and we have minds. Our hearts tend to react with emotion. Emotion gives us love, gives us hatred. We don't know where they come from. We don't know why the capitalists and the Montagues were at war, do we? We never know what caused that incident. We never know why Romeo fell in love with Juliet so fast after he had been crazy about Rosalind in the first scene of the play. He was crazy about Rosalind. He forgets Rosalind and switches to Juliet just like that. Because love is, re is emotion, is heart, it's not logic. But then there's also logic. And there's also reason. And that's another aspect to, to, to man, that he can think. As I already said, Shakespeare died on his birthday. He was not, in the, word, in the words of Twelfth Night's Malvolio, born great. And he did not have greatness thrust upon him. But he did work hard, and he achieved greatness of an unparalleled magnitude. The title of this short talk was Shakespeare's Europe, but what's in the name? Yes, we did touch upon some of the history of his time, we had to, and his influence as that having been his Europe. We would, however, be just as correct as saying, in saying that this Europe we have today, its culture, its language, its diversity of character and ethnicity, its prejudices, it's unfairness sometimes. It's social divisions. It's as much Shakespeare's Europe in 2014 as it was in 1564, 450 years ago. When Shakespeare died on his 52nd birthday, the 24th April, 23rd April, sorry, 1616, Ben Jonson, the great playwright of his time, the contemporary, who, while not exactly his greatest friend, in fact, he was quite a bitter rival during his lifetime, 
and he also wrote lines during his lifetime to make fun of Shakespeare and to denigrate Shakespeare, he would say, he was not of an age, but for all time. Today as much as yesterday, these are my words now, not Johnson's. Today as much as yesterday and tomorrow as much as today, here, there, and everywhere. Thank you. That was longer than, than the applause of before the speech. Does that count for something? That counts for a lot. <laughs> Thank you. And I think it means what, what we, we all felt, that you know, the enthusiasm that this person has for, for Shakespeare, who for many of us may have been you know, just a boring book you needed to read at school with a teacher who was completely uninterested in what they were teaching. And we finally found someone who, who loves the subject and pa has passed on to us the enthusiasm around the subject. Now we are going to... I would like to ask, do you mind if I ask for any feedback? Maybe somebody would like to comment? Is there anyone who would like to comment or...? You teach Shakespeare because I knew it by heart, but then, you know, I, I never appreciated it by like, was... Why he was called bard in bardo? A bard, um, I think it's a Scottish term, but I don't like to pronounce myself unless I'm sure. But I think it's a Scottish term which refers to someone who writes. If there's someone else who knows the background to this and could help me with this, I would appreciate it, but I'm sure it refers to someone who writes poetry because Shakespeare was primarily a poet. Doesn't it come from the word scop, the poet musician, and then it was later in Italy, Bardo, the person who was very eloquent and spoke well, so it came from the poet musician in Beowulf's times. As I said, I appreciate anybody commenting to the answer to this because I cannot answer this question with any degree of certainty. It's a poet, right? It means a poet, yeah. We have confirmation. Someone just checked it on the internet. <laughs> or went to the globe. I'm, I'm interested. You, I, I, was interested by the part, I was interested by all of it, but I, I enjoyed the part of your speech where you were speaking about um, the way he was maybe using his plays to influence history and to influence the course of events. Now, I've never thought of Shakespeare as a particularly political playwright. Uh, Obviously, we've got obviously the, the history plays do their part to support the regime. We've got the, the very dangerous part of Richard II and the abdication of a childless king and all that problems. Um, and in fact, we know that, sorry, abdication followed by murder. Um, and we know that that scene was censored in, in certain things. But beyond that, do you believe that he was pushing a certain political agenda, especially in the non-history plays, because those obviously serve a purpose. Do I get another five minutes? Right. So. You asked me to avoid the history plays, and I will. And I will go to, and I mentioned Elizabeth I. But after Elizabeth I, the Tudors stopped. They ran out. Elizabeth was childless. She was the virgin queen. She had no kids. So, going back in the genealogy, four or five generations up, they traced lineage to the Stuarts. And the, the only Stuart who was around, the only Stuart royal who was around, was James VI of Scotland. So he had the most credible claim to the throne. So he was given the throne as James I of England. And Scotland and England were merged. I think they had a referendum after that and they weren't merged anymore. But since the, and after that, they merged again. But I'm not sure it was a referendum. Now, how political was Shakespeare in that? I already made reference to Midsummer Night's Dream and to his depiction of, I didn't go into the detail of his depiction of Tatiana, which is, who is the, the goddess who, who resembles very much Elizabeth in, in her character. But if you, just, if you see, look at Macbeth. James I well, hated witches. He hated the influence of witchcraft. He had written a book against witches. He believed that his father had been murdered through witchcraft. James I was Scottish. And after the murder of the king, when he's at dinner and the ghosts start appearing to him, there's the lineup of the kings who would follow eventually. And it starts with that's Banquo's family. And at the very end of the line, there's James holding the double scepter. So 
Is it coincidence that Shakespeare wrote his play just after James came to power, where he attacks witchcraft, where he refers to him taking the double, double throne of Scotland and England? I don't think so. So, in other interventions I've had about Shakespeare, I've delved a bit deeper into how much of a psychophant Shakespeare was, how he always tried to suck up to the power of the day and tried to make sure that he... And there was a very valid reason why. Because the existence of the theater, allowing plays, was not to be taken for granted. The theater was tolerated. It was on the other side of the Thames. The London powers that be could, at the snap of a finger, close the theaters. The only grouping that Shakespeare would attack outright and not be nice to and not mitigate were the Puritans. Because the Puritans were absolutely against theater. So he knew that however much he sucked up to them, whatever color his nose would become, if you know what I mean, there was no way that the Puritans would ever tolerate theater. So he has Malvolio, dressed up in yellow, the Puritan, made fun of on the stage. And he goes head on with the Puritans. He has no problem with them. But as for all the rest, he condemns regicide throughout. He promotes England all the way. And when it was time for him,